Welcome to the third hour of our program. On the line with us, our old buddy Greg Palace, the investigative journalist, author, filmmaker. His latest film in the making is Long Knife, Osage Oil and the New Trail of Tears. You can watch a 100-second teaser over at gregpalast.com, G-R-E-G-B-A-L-A-S-T. Uh, Greg underscore Palace is his Twitter handle. Uh, gregpalace.com, though, is the website. And this is all uh, apropos of Leo DiCaprio's new movie, uh, Killers, of the Flower, uh, Killers of the Flower Moon. Greg, welcome back to the program. Um, it, it, give us a, um, a kind of a backstory here. Why, you know, who, who were the Osage um, and why, why, uh, why make a movie out of it? <laughs> Two movies out of it. That's what's happening. So we have the film Killers of the Flower Moon. I think you may have heard of it unless you've been hiding under a rock. I saw it on Sunday. Yes. So it, it's, you know, a work of genius, but more important, it's a work of real history that it's about time we learn about what happened to Native American natives, but in particular, the Osage tribe, who I started working with uh, almost three decades ago. <laughs> After Killers of the Flower Moon, just quickly what happens is that the, the United there was the biggest oil strike in America at the time in, in the 1920s under Osage uh, land. Uh, these Indians per capita became the, uh, the richest people on the planet. And the U.S. government and the big oil companies that were just forming, they actually hadn't formed yet. This, they would form out of the Osage land. And uh, what they did was... Um, they auctioned off the Osage land to the big oil companies that created Getty Oil, ConocoPhillips, Exxon, came out of there. They were nothing until then. And, um, and then uh, each full-blooded Osage was assigned a guardian because they were considered incompetent, unable to handle their own affairs. But I should mention that they'd used their money to send – they went to Stanford, Oxford, UCLA, USC. These were – and they were listed as incompetent, unable to handle their own affairs. Right, right. Then their guardians began to kill them one by one, ma making themselves beneficiary of their wills. That's the story of Killers of the Flower Moon of the 20. About 200 Osage, up to 200 Osage were killed for their oil. But what then, we're making a second film. When I say we, George DiCaprio, um, and uh, with his son's help and enthusiastic support, Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, we are making... The hundred years since Killers of the Flower Moon, that ends in the 20s. We're in the 2020s. And in that hundred years, we want to talk about the Osage in their own words. We want to tell you about the killers who followed the killers of the Flower Moon. In particular, their name is Coke, Charlie Coke. You know, uh, our film is simple. About half the film and covering this hundred years since, since then is the 40 years under Cokeocracy of the Osage Reservation. He's, by this time, the Osage were stripped of their oil. They were poor. They were living in trailers. They didn't have much. They had these little stripper wells. And the Bureau of Indian Affairs allowed Coke oil to go around and gather up their oil uh, in trucks. And they would take 30 barrels of oil, the Coke oil trucks, 30 barrels of oil, and pay for 20. How? And uh, it was... <laughs> I don't want to oversimplify it, but let's put it this way. You pull up a truck in the middle of the night, as Chief Standing Bear tells us in our documentary. They pull up in the middle of the night, and they say, oh, we're it's an honor system. They would take oil out of the tanks, put it in their tanker trucks, send it back to Charlie Coke, and put in a little jar a piece of paper saying how much they took. I'm not kidding. Wow. It's like you go to the store and say, oh, here's a... Oh, yeah, I think I got about $20 worth of groceries. See you later and leave a little slip. No one's watching. And here's the thing. We have 50, 50 drivers who say that Charlie Koch personally ordered this theft. Really? He, I mean, Charles he, Koch is a multi-billionaire. He, he inherited, he, he was born a multi-millionaire. His father, you know, built this big oil company. Why would he bother stealing, you know, penny ante stuff from, from Native Americans? I don't get it. Uh, we have a wired conversation in which Charles Coke, Charlie, as everyone calls him, that Charlie Coke, when asked, hey, you're pretty rich. Why is he taking like $10, $10 a month from some poor Indian family? And his answer was, because I want my fair share. And that's all of it. Seriously? That is a quote. And not only do I have it on tape, but I had, he used it another time. I won't. I can't say what organization is, but a very 
major nonprofit, Charlie Koch used the head of the organization called me, the, the chairman, and said, Charlie Koch used my organization, this major public charity, as a front for illegal campaign contributions. And when asked, why would you do this to this little to this nonprofit organization? And, and Koch again said, because I want my fair share. And that's all of it. So you're going to get the full 40 years of of massive theft, about $2.4 billion worth of oil. And then why Charlie Koch isn't in prison? You have to ask. I mean, you know, you, you and I steal 10 bucks from a gas station. We're in the can. So you take $2.4 billion of oil that's not yours. There was an indictment written up. There was a grand jury impaneled, and Charlie Koch was charged with the th same thing as Donald Trump, racketeering, RICO. And he was also charged with theft from an Indian reservation. I'm not just talking about Coke oil. I'm talking about Charles Koch personally was about to be indicted. It never happens that a grand jury's impaneled, that the FBI writes up a draft indictment, and then it goes away. But what happened was is that Koch, this is where the Koch political machine began. It, their money machine began with Osage stolen oil, and their political machine began there. Because then Koch dumped tons of money into GOP coffers, and with Bob Dole's help, and with the help of- uh, Bob Dole Senate, was then uh, the senior Senate leader, right? In from Kansas, where, where Coke is based, right. out of which, and what happened was they dumped in massive amount of money into the hands of Senator Don Nichols from Oklahoma. He replaced, it's up to the senators, he replaced the prosecutor the federal prosecutor in the Koch case with one of his buddies, with one of Koch's buddies, the guy closed, shut down the grand jury, quashed the indictment, and even wrote, did something no prosecutor ever does. He wrote Koch a letter saying, uh, there's no evidence that you're stealing anything. <laughs> it's mm. like, no one gets that. And then this, this guy, this prosecutor who was brought in, did this one little act for Koch and his buddies, and was then made a federal judge. This is how the game works. And wow. the OC he got rewarded. Yep, he got rewarded. So that's so even today that hurts. You'll see. To this past week, I wrote a, an article for the Guardian about the documentary that I'm making with the DiCaprios. And um, um, what in as I say in the Guardian, it's still raw. I quote. Everett Waller. Everett Waller is the chairman of the tribe's resource committee. Mm -hmm. And he is, by the way, you'll find out he's listed. He went to college. He's an engineer. He knows this stuff. He told, um, he told the, B the Bureau of Indian Affairs, when you knew that Coke oil was taking three barrels of oil and paying for just two, why didn't you hang them right then? That was their responsibility, letting them steal billions from the poorest people in America, they went from the richest to the poor, and they're taking the last bits. And the BIA just stood there, which is why they are so angry today. They want this story told. And um, so we made a promise to the Osage that while and, and uh, Marty Scorsese has been very helpful on this, too. Yeah. Is there any is there any effort to uh, claw back any of those uh, ill gotten gains from Coke oil? Yes. Well, one of the problems was that because the government case, the government threw out its case. Mm -hmm. uh, Coke oil paid pennies. Like they got some like $300 per family, I was being told uh, many years ago. But then with the new leadership, uh, a uh, leadership uh, by there was an uprising in the tribe led by a, a journalist, Jim Gray, and his associate, now the chief, the principal chief standing bear. And they actually ran on a platform, get rid of Coke and, and these thieves, and let's get some of our money back. They couldn't get it from Coke, but they did successfully sue the uh, U.S. government for failing its responsibilities as trustees. Mm -hmm. So they received a, a large check from, from you and me because our own Bureau of Indian Affairs was basically had its eyes closed. Was there corruption? I can't prove it. But yeah. they literally watched billions of dollars of oil being stolen. And so they- Over so, a 40 or 50 year period. That's right. So the Osage want the rest of their story told. They also want you to understand why they want to bring it up a hundred years is that they're not just victims. As uh, former chief Jim Gray told me, 
we don't, it was a wonderful film, Killers of the Flower Moon, telling our, basically our Holocaust story, our terrible story. But we didn't just end up as victims. We are warriors still trying to claim rights to our land and rights to our lives. The Osage are the only tribe I know of that actually purchased their own reservation territory. They just bought it from the Cherokee. And then it was to reservation. So they were kind of conquered after they bought the land and lost control of it. They want control back of their land from the U.S. government, which switched from the deadly guardianship game where they were literally shooting Osage and individuals were getting the money. What you have now is this kind of guardianship overlordship. And they call the, the chief agent of the BIA on their property is known as the Mahita or the long knife. And that's where that comes from. The, uh, the long knife that's still over their head. So they, they want some freedom. And, and ultimately, there's a lot of story in, that we're going to tell in 40 minutes of 100 years of Osage life. But they're still up against the Cokes because what they want to do now is get out of the oil business and move to geothermal. But they don't have control of their land. And you have <laughs> if Donald Trump comes back in now, Joe Biden is the first guy to put a uh, an American native in charge of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and in charge of the Department of Interior. But if if uh, that ends, so there's at least some chance now of a real serious reform mm. uh, and help for the Osage and, and basically liberation of their lives and land. But if, you know, if, uh, if that gets lost and it's back to oil company control of Department of Interior, um, you know, and who's pushing this? We have to look at the climate science denial campaign of the Koch brothers. So you still have the Osage at the front lines confronting the Kochs. But you have to know, this was where Coke Oil's money and political machine Death Star, the political Death Star started. Originated. Amazing. You can you can see the uh, the trailer for it over at gregpalace.com or the teaser for it. Long Knife, Osage Oil and the New Trail of Tears, the great Greg Palace. Greg, thanks so much for dropping by. You're very welcome, Tom.